This is for Keeps, a podcast about collections and connections. I'm David Peterkovsky. You don't have to be a sociologist to notice that the world has two kinds of people. The ones who believe they can better their lives using self-empowerment tools such as self-help books. And the ones who are, shall we say, non-believers. The skeptics and social critics of our world usually fall into the latter category. And who better to illustrate that point than the late comedian George Carlin? And the part I really don't understand, if you're looking for self-help, why would you read a book written by somebody else? That's not self-help. That's help. There's no such thing as self-help. If you did it yourself, you didn't need help. You did it yourself. I gotta say, he makes some reasonable points. Those jokes may have scored some big laughs, But the self-help industry, and the publishing of self-help books in particular, has been big business for decades. Definitive numbers are a bit elusive, but the global personal development industry as a whole, including the publishing of self-help books, reportedly neared the $40 billion revenue mark in 2020, according to the business consulting firm Grandview Research. And in 2019, A market research report from the NPD Group reported that self-help book sales in the U.S. alone grew to a healthy 18.6 million units. Throw in the rising popularity of online courses, audiobooks, and self-improvement apps, and you've got an industry that, to its corporate investors, must seem like chicken soup for the stockholders. Experts point to books published way back in the 18th and 19th centuries as forebears of the genre. But self-help books really began to resonate in the 1930s, when Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People struck a chord with readers looking to improve their lives. 1952 brought us the bestseller The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. And in the ensuing decades, an endless stream of authors, including Deepak Chopra, Tony Robbins, Stephen Covey, M. Scott Peck, Dr. Phil, Mark Manson, Jen Sincero, Brene Brown, and countless others have taken their thoughts on how to live our best lives and turned them into bestsellers. One person who's fascinated by our collective pursuit of happiness is Christine Whelan. She's devoted much of her career to the self-help field, not only as a researcher and educator, but as an author of several self-improvement books in her own right, including... Mary Smart, The Intelligent Woman's Guide to True Love, and The Big Picture, A Guide to Finding Your Purpose in Life. Christine teaches at the University of Wisconsin, where she's a clinical professor in the Department of Consumer Science. And, as she's studied self-help as a cultural phenomenon, she's managed to build up quite the self-help book collection, with roughly 200 or so personal improvement titles lining the shelves in her office. Christine's not only studied those works, but she's actually used her collection to write another book of her own, in which she had her students test drive advice from classics like the 1859 book Self-Help by Samuel Smiles, to more recent titles including 2003's The Finish Rich Workbook by David Bach. More on that project later. Christine grew up being fascinated with advice of all kinds and even devoted her master's thesis to studying attitudes on dating and marriage as seen in men's and women's magazines. But it wasn't until young adulthood that she found her attraction to advice and self-help might have been genetic. I didn't learn until my early 20s that my grandmother had been Dale Carnegie's personal secretary for a couple months during World War II. And I remember when I found out, it was sort of like a light bulb went off. And I thought, oh, well, that explains it. You know, our family has been in the advice industry for for quite some time. Yeah. And uh, natural follow-up question, how was your grandmother at winning friends and influencing people? 
My grandmother was a charming lady, and she, I think, really kind of embodied the advice of Dale Carnegie. I have to say, I was quite young when she died. Unfortunately, she died when I was in my early 20s. But she had all sorts of wonderful lines that were very quaint and from that period. Like when I told her I was going to get my doctorate, she said, well, the PhD is great, but what about your MRS? And (laughs) she offered some wonderful advice about families and child rearing, things like every baby comes with its own loaf of bread, suggesting that (laughs) that there are economic possibilities, even in tough times when you put family first. And I think that was one of the things that came out of Dale Carnegie's Depression era stuff as well. The family connection to self-help didn't skip a generation, however. Christine's mother was a prolific writer who made a name for herself in the public health advice field. She wrote 27 books that were translational science. She took scientific research and she translated them into news that normal people could use in their everyday life. So she wrote books on everything from family planning to anti-smoking guides to uh, nutrition and diet. And she was often on the politically incorrect side of things because she believed in very much focusing on the research, whether or not it was the conventional wisdom. She went on TV a lot and she had a nationally syndicated radio show in the 1980s. And as the family joke goes, I was an only child and she realized she'd have to get a babysitter or set me up with a play date while she went to do her radio shows. But then she had the idea that instead I could host my own radio show at the same time and that would work quite nicely. So when I was eight years old, she put me in the studio next to her. And so after she would interview scientists, I would interview them and try to get the scientists to translate all of this medical guidance into kids language as well. So yeah, I I got kind of an early start in this business. Yeah, and uh, you you got a play date like no other, it sounds like. (laughs) (laughs) Indeed I did, and sometimes I even got to invite my eight-year-old friends on with me, which was pretty sweet. Self-help hardly turned out to be just child's play for Christine. As an adult, after her aforementioned master's thesis, she pursued her PhD and returned to that all-too-familiar subject. My doctoral dissertation was on the history of self-help from 1950 to 2000. And what I did was I looked at why people read more self-help during this period, why the industry more than doubled as a percentage of all books in print during this period, and sort of what it says about who we were as people at the end of the century there. So I was particularly interested in the books themselves. And the self-help industry is really huge. You know, there are self-help seminars, there are self-help audio series. But I was particularly interested in the books themselves because they were a low cost and sort of private commitment that people could make to change um, with a fairly low barrier to entry. These books were fairly inexpensive. And starting in the 1930s, they became really something that the masses could have. And what would that advice be? And how does the advice in those books shape cultural norms? So few academics thought that it was worthwhile to study these books because we think of them as sort of frivolous. You know, they don't tend to have any research behind them, really. And often a lot of the advice doesn't work. But I saw them as incredibly important to the fabric of who we want to be in each particular period and, in a sense, giving us a shared cultural language to talk about our hopes and dreams. And I imagine that as you did your research, you began to, if not collect intentionally, at least accumulate some of the self-help books in your collection, as it were. I joke with my students that when they come into my office, they think that I am very troubled. It looks like I have every problem on the planet, from codependence to diet issues to trouble keeping organized, because I have dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of self-help books on my shelf, um, whether it's in my home office or, or my work office. I, I love these books because they, they tell a story. They, they're full of promises. They're, they're full of hope. And having actually the, the physical books themselves is interesting because of how they, uh, 
package the advice. So what are the promises that are on the cover? What are the promises that are on the back cover? And how do the, the format of the books change? I try for the most part to have the original copies of the self-help books whenever possible, or at least the paperback reprints from that era, because it really gives you, I think, more of a sense of why the book was so popular at the time it was. A favorite story of Christine's revolves around the time she took one of her self-help books on a trip, arousing the concern of a fellow traveler. There are also these books that people make all sorts of assumptions about you when you read them. So one of my favorite stories is when I was in my early 20s and I was on a train in England. I did my doctoral dissertation at Oxford and I was visiting a friend. But of course, you know, good doctoral student that I was, I was, I was working on the train. And so I was sitting there reading uh, Women Who Love Too Much, which is a book about being in codependent relationships. And I was very involved in this book. I was highlighting, I was annotating, I was really thinking about the implications for my dissertation. And I did not notice that there was a lovely older woman across from me who was watching me with a great deal of concern. And she put her hand on my knee and said, honey, it's going to be okay. <laughs> and <laughs> I realized that I must have looked like a pretty concerning specimen, um, you know, being so anxious and, and, and so focused on this book. So we have lots of, of cultural narratives around these guides. And uh, I don't know, some of them you have to be careful reading in public. <laughs> For sure. And so let's talk specifics about your collection of books. Do you have favorites as far as individual books go or maybe <laughs> favorite self-help authors? I would say my longtime favorite has to be, and perhaps there's no surprise here, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. The reason I love that book is in part because there was so much criticism and controversy around it. So when How to Win Friends and Influence People came out in the 1930s, in 1936, some folks criticized it as a superficial how to get a job guide or how to sort of pull one over on someone to make them like you. I, I think that that sort of misses the point. It was really part of the shift from a more um, religious advice-based period into a more pragmatic advice-based period where it was about doing the best you can and learning skills that are going to have a positive impact in your everyday life. And what's so fun about the original Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People, is that he breaks it down into little vignettes and blurbs. And he breaks each chapter down into 1930s style bullet points, basically. Whereas most of the books of this period, you would see paragraphs and paragraphs of text. He had bolded headings and short paragraphs. And this was really a new style of information dissemination. He was, he was ahead of his time in that way. And he was one of the first authors to be embraced by Pocket Books, which was a low-cost imprint to get books out for only a dime at the drugstore or at the supermarket. And so really, this, this was part of his huge success, was that these books were able to be printed for a low cost, sold at a low cost, and then out there to as many people as possible. And because the human experience is complicated, the books in Christine's collection address all sorts of issues. Everything from building healthier habits to becoming more responsible financially. That complexity leads to a bigger question about what self-help is and what it isn't. The idea of self-help books might seem vague to some people. I'm curious, how do you define self-help as a literary genre or phenomenon? Self-help books, by my definition, are books that have an explicit promise for behavior change in some way. Self-help books are ones that are nonfiction, whether they work or not, at least they purport to be not fictionalized uh, views of life. And they also deal with a psychological element of life. So for example, I distinguish self-help books from how-to guides around that question of psychological promise. So I would say that a how to improve your golf swing is a how-to book, whereas how to improve your relationship is a self-help book. Now, both have some psychological and emotional components. People can be very passionate about their golf game, and improving your relationship can often require some very tactical changes. But the psychological promise of betterment is a, a feature that is made through all self-help books. 
And one of the sort of fun facts that most people don't know about self-help books is that the single largest category of self-help books in print today and really throughout the decades has been religious self-help books. So the intersection of faith and purpose and meaning has run through these books for hundreds of years. And in that faith-based subgenre, Christine has some favorites, including one written by a self-help stalwart and one written by an author better known for the fantasy world of Narnia. The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale is a wonderful book because it translates Christianity into the, the psychological genre of self-help. It's like that halfway point, I think. And it, it was also criticized during its time for um, for being a little too pop psych and uh, and not enough focused on God. So some people would say that the book was about what God can do for you, not about what you can do for God. Um, but it offers some really great advice about how to act in accordance with faith principles. So I, I like that about it. Um, but then I also like C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. And, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think of that as a self-help book, but that is a collection of his radio addresses that were supposed to be inspirational, advice-driven lectures to help people live their faith. And so then when published as a book, you know, it kind of straddles the genres. So C.S. Lewis kind of backed his way into the self-help genre. He did. And, you know, and, and so many pastors do these days, right? Because if you're translating religious advice into things that you can do in your everyday life that are going to have positive impacts on you, you know, where is the line between theology and self-help? And this is something that goes way, way, way back through self-help. You could argue that the Bible was the first and most best-selling self-help book of all time. Good point. <laughs> Never thought of it that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> So I want to switch gears and talk about one of your books, and that's your 2011 book, Generation WTF, which has the glorious subtitle, From What the <laughs> to a Wise, Tenacious, and Fearless You. What's especially interesting to me is the premise of the book. You had your students test drive advice from self-help classics, and I don't know, maybe they were books from your own collection. Um, how did you come up with that idea? It was 2007, and the financial crisis was brewing and my students were coming into my office saying to me, I've tried to do everything right. You know, I, I took out my student loans so that I could go to college. I've worked hard, but WTF, like, you know, the, the, the rug just got pulled out from under me. And I remember sitting in my office with one particular young man looking just sort of forlorn and, and kind of a mixture of, of shell-shocked and frustrated. And he said, well, what do I do? And I looked over to my left at my huge collection of self-help books, and my eyes happened to land on How to Win Friends and Influence People, which was written during the Great Depression. And it was a guide to helping people do the best they can and find a job in tough circumstances. So I said to him, perhaps we don't need to reinvent the wheel. What if we looked at some of the classic advice from other periods of economic challenge in the United States? And I selected that book. I also selected M. Scott Peck, The Road Less Traveled, which was written during the oil crisis of the 1970s. And I said, well, why don't we see whether there's anything in here that could be useful? This began an experiment that I ran with dozens and then hundreds of students, giving them these books and saying, hey, how can you translate this to be meaningful to you in your life right now? And the students really enjoyed it because, you know, they, they were getting this old time advice. And then I encouraged them to test it out in their lives. And when one young man tested out uh, some of the Dale Carnegie advice on a nice police officer who had pulled him over for speeding. And instead of arguing with the police officer, he admitted his mistake. He was respectful to the officer. And sure enough, the officer gave him a pass and he did not get a ticket. And this young man was amazed that it worked and became a true believer after that, I think. And now we all have a little helpful tip next time we're pulled over. Exactly. <laughs> 
there was also some fun advice that sometimes worked and sometimes didn't. So, for example, Benjamin Franklin was known for the uh, for lots of advice as well. Uh, so, poor Richard's Almanac. I mean, these are very sort of early American self help books. Uh, and one of the bits of advice that Ben Franklin gives is if you want to make a friend, you can ask them a favor. So he tells a story of asking to borrow a book from one of his colleagues in Congress uh, that he didn't know very well, but he sort of wanted the book and he thought this would also be a nice way to have something in common with the colleague. The colleague lent him a book, he read it, and then they struck up a conversation afterwards about it and became good friends. And so the Franklin advice is to ask a favor as a way to make a friend. And my, when my students tried this out, they learned that it only works in person. So if they were to ask the favor via text message or try to do this uh, via email, it didn't work nearly as well as it did face to face. And so these were the other sort of fun things that came from remixing this classic advice, too. <laughs> We need a, a Snapchat-based uh, uh -huh. advice book at some point. <laughs> Keep up with the times. As a self-help historian, researcher, and de facto book collector, Christine has noticed shifts in the types of books that have been published over the decades. Those shifts, driven in large part by changes in prevailing cultural attitudes. I looked at the early self-help, really sort of pre-1930s, 1940s, and that was mostly religiously based. So that was focused on that intersection of faith and psychology. Then starting in the 1930s and 40s with Dale Carnegie, um, Dr. Spock and his parenting guides, it really moved away from faith and into that more pragmatic self-help genre. This was also um, heading into the World War II era and then post-World War II era, where it was about doing the best you can and practical steps to make life work. There was a huge shift in the 1960s. So from the 1960s to the 80s, we see a much more inner-directed self-help that was all about me, 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 looking at the inner child, um, looking at codependency, looking at sort of challenges with the inner psyche. So rather than presentation of self as an external thing, self-help became more of an internal pursuit. The 1990s saw still more shifts changes that reflected the words and actions of an American president. Just as Bill Clinton was saying, you know, I feel your pain, uh, that was very much that inner-directed language of I feel your pain, I, I am right with you. That's what he came into uh, his, his first term with. And then he was impeached when our tenor of our country changed and went into a sort of, if it's tough, I'm sorry, you know, you just got to deal with it. Um, and Dr. Phil comes on the scene and says, no more of this inner soul searching. Just get down to business, as the Nike commercial would say, just do it. And then we got into, I would say, a much harsher period of self-help, where it was really blaming the victim, in a way, um, and saying, this is all on you, it's all your choice. Very, very individual focused. And I think that lasted until about 2010, I'd say. And now it seems that we are in potentially the first period of purpose-based pro-social self-help that we've seen in quite a while, where it is about improving your own life so that you can do good in the world. And this is something that is really important to me because one of my challenges with self-help has always been how solipsistic it is. It's very navel-gazing. You're always sort of looking inward, which is important, um, but it is mostly important if you also have a purpose to do good in the world at large. And so my hope is that we're entering into a period where self-help and social change do not have to be in conflict with each other. I'm wondering, have any of the books that you've collected and studied aged especially poorly, maybe due to changes in attitudes or evolving perceptions related to human behavior? Yes. So there was a book that was incredibly popular in the 1970s called The Total Woman. And it, <laughs> it was all about... Um, 
how to be a perfect woman and wife. For example, so right after you fed your husband breakfast and sent him off for the morning, you were supposed to make dinner for that evening and prepare so that you could then go about your chores. And then about an hour or so before he would arrive, you were supposed to take a bath and get relaxed and ready to greet him, uh, potentially uh, wrapping yourself in saran wrap or other exciting things uh, to greet him in a fabulous way when he got home. <laughs> so, there, so <laughs> yeah, I mean, some of these books are pretty hilarious in terms of their, their gendered advice, uh, and they really speak to whatever the ideal was at the time. And, and just so we're clear, you didn't have any of your students test drive the Total Woman book? I did not. No. Uh, I, <laughs> I, think, I think I might have gotten fired for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask you about something you said in an article that appeared in the publication City Journal back in 2012. You're quoted in that story as saying that most self-help books are disappointing and that, quote, they often seek to solve problems that can't really be solved by reading a book on your own. Do you still feel that way? Yes, I do. Self-help, because it is structured as an individually focused pursuit, often misses the fact that so many of our individual problems are caused by larger structural and social inequalities and challenges. And so if you are really focused on making the individual the, the only one who can be the person to make the change, then you, you lose the big picture, right? The structural change. In addition, there's an element of blaming the victim associated with self-help because, you know, individuals can only change so much about their circumstances. So th these situations can be much thornier than just you making a couple changes on the margins here and there. The research suggests that self-help and behavior change tends to be the most successful when it is about changing your mind rather than about changing your actions. If I had a fear of spiders and you did a fear intervention, then that actually could work. Or if I read a self-help book about why I needed to, like, you know, kinder to myself or, or have a different sort of self-image. That is more likely to work than, for example, a relationship self-help book where not only do I need to make a change, but I need my partner to make a change as well. And so anytime behavior change involves other people, it is twice as hard as when it just involves you. And quite frankly, it's pretty hard when it just involves you as well. We see the best change when these books are used in conjunction with therapy or in conjunction with other group support. In addition to tracking the publishing of self-help books, Christine also has kept tabs on the emergence of social media, YouTube, podcasts, and audiobooks as channels for delivering self-improvement content to eager consumers. Not that there isn't room for improvement there. The challenge is that watching a video is even more of a passive action than reading a book. And when you read a book or, or do a workbook and you're able to annotate and do things in the margins, be an active reader, uh, you're more likely to understand the information and even be able to go back to it than when if you're just sort of passively watching a video. So I, I worry about that a little bit, but of course I understand it. I mean, YouTube, TikTok, you name it, there are video channels out there for all sorts of how to and self-help. Personally, I still go with the, uh, the hard copy book. Uh-huh. Although I do want to ask you, I think your newest book is an audio book. Is that right? Yes. So interestingly enough, my new book is, um, it's, a, it's a lecture series called Finding Your Purpose from Audible, and it's a, a great courses lecture series. I got a wonderful email just a couple days ago from a woman who said, I have listened to your lecture series over and over again, and I've gotten so much out of it. But I'm, I'm dying to know, is there a transcript somewhere? I would really like to be able to print this out and be able to take notes and to read it instead. And I wrote her back saying, oh, I feel you. Um, I, I, it, was, it was such a wonderful email to receive. And, and so I said, you know, there's no official transcript. But if you tell me what section in particular you want to work on, I'll send you my notes. So I, I do think that there are people like me out there who very much like the written word as well. 
Christine's foray into the world of audiobooks shouldn't come as too much of a surprise, given her frequent public speaking engagements and her background as a radio host in her youth. Speaking of that, remember how we established that Christine is a third-generation participant in the self-help field, following her grandmother's work for Dale Carnegie and her mother's writing and research career? Well, it turns out that a fourth generation of the family, another female, has dipped her toe into the genre as well, bringing a new spin to the No Kidding radio show from Christine's childhood. History repeats itself because my daughter, who is now nine years old, has her own podcast called Health is Everything, No Kidding, which is the 21st century version of, of this, where she is interviewing scientists about health matters and translating it into kids speak herself. And so that's at the Emory Center for the Study of Human Health. Today I'm joined by Dr. Rakesh Jain, a psychiatrist and researcher. Thanks for talking with me, Dr. Jain. I am happy to join you, Eleanor. Thank you for inviting me. Worries are kind of weird. Why does my brain have worries? Like, why do I think that monsters are going to make... That's terrific, and uh, I guess there was no avoiding it in her case. It's a (laughs) handed-down trait. I did give her a choice, and she seemed kind of excited to do it, so... Perfect. So, one last question for you. Since you study self-help literature and you have a few books to your own name, I was thinking that it would naturally follow that you'd be the most well-adjusted person I've ever encountered. But but then I was thinking that we're all sort of works in progress. So I'm wondering, do you find yourself revisiting the books you've got in your office? (laughs) I love that question. We teach what we need to learn. And then the other phrase that goes along with that is doctor, heal thyself. So I joke that I study happiness and personal improvement, which quite frankly means that I need to work on happiness and personal improvement. I do go back and look at books. And there was one time in particular when I had a very rough period in my life several years ago. And I found myself sitting on the side of my bed crying and really unable to think about what I was going to do next, and I felt lost. And then my next thought was, are you kidding me, Christine? You just wrote a book on finding your purpose. Why are you sitting here crying? Read your own book. So I picked up my book, and I flipped through it, and I said, this is all fine and good, but how do you put it into practice when difficult things happen to you in your life? And this is actually why how the finding your purpose lecture series came about. And what I talk about now when I teach and I give lectures about self-improvement and and finding purpose and meaning, which is that because my sort of initial attempt at this didn't work in my own life when things got really, really hard, I I realized that I needed to create something that would work for me. And what came out of it was something I think much more real, I guess, about understanding the fears and anxieties that come up when you engage in behavior change and how to address those and not put such a perky, smiley face on everything. And one of the challenges for me as a writer, and I think is probably true for anybody who even puts a toe into the advice industry, is that the stuff that you have out there in print is out there in print even as you grow and change and evolve. And and so I think we should all take self-help books as as part of a work in progress, right? And and that's actually what the research suggests people do, that we read these books and we pick and choose what works for us. We don't take all of it and, and we find the nugget and incorporate that into our lives. So I encourage everybody, just like I am doing myself, to continue growing with this and to take the nuggets that work, discount the nuggets that don't, and be really critical consumers of these self-help books, because they're all written by people who themselves are struggling with their own stuff. Uh Uh-huh. And and by the way, for the record, I I didn't mean to pry as to what you might have been working on personally. Oh, 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 no, 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 not at all. Not at all. I mean, I'm, um, (laughs) I'm actually, I'm very, very open about it. Um, This was all around my divorce. And in my divorce settlement, um, I had the judge write in that I could talk publicly about my own struggles around this and the, my own struggles around the dissolution of my marriage. Because if you aren't transparent and you sort of put up the veneer of perfection, 
then I think it's deeply inauthentic. And I think that's the problem with a lot of self-help is that so many of the self-help gurus have to put themselves out as these perfect people um, who can never make a mistake. And that actually undermines their ability to help. So I'm, I'm really, I'm quite, um, I'm quite passionate about being as real as possible and admitting the limitations of this genre while not discounting it because, again, it is part of the shared fabric of our cultural discourse. Well, Christine, that's everything I've got for you. I want to thank you for helping us understand your fascination with self-help books on both a professional and a personal level. This has been fun. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Yes, and be well. You too. Okay, take care. I appreciate it. Okay, bye. Bye Bye-bye. Well, you have to appreciate Christine Whelan's drive to understand the lasting appeal of self-help books to those who believe in their power to change lives. And she gets bonus points for being candid about the things she's worked through with the help of the books she's got at hand. If there's something the average person needs to work on to improve their life, it seems there's probably a book out there to help them sort it out. And there's a decent chance it's on the shelf in Christine's office. For Keeps is a production of me, David Peterkovsky. My thanks to Christine Whelan for opening up about her lifelong interest in self-improvement and her research-driven collection of self-help books. At ForKeepsPodcast.com, You'll see photos of Christine, both from the present day and in her prime as a pint-sized radio host, as well as cover images from a couple of her own additions to the self-help literary canon. The show's theme song is by Still Flyin', and the closing theme is by Eric Frisch. Additional music for this episode was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. You can visit the show online at forkeepspodcast.com, or follow For Keeps on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at For Keeps Podcast. And if you like the show, hit the subscribe button, hit the share button in your podcast player, or post a positive review for the show wherever you get your podcasts. I would appreciate the help. Thanks for listening to For Keeps. Until next time, keep on keeping on.